Welcome to the 2019 Isuzu D-Max. Oh, actually, sorry, this is the... The example we're looking at here is the X-Rider, which kind of replaces the old X-Runner, I think it was called, special edition. Uh, but this is not a special edition. This is a permanent part of the range. Kind of goes up against the likes of the Ranger Sport and Triton GLS. It looks pretty good. It's got dark wheels, dark handles, and all that kind of thing. And then inside, it's based on the LSM entry model. So cloth seats. It doesn't have the big nine inch touch screen. It's only got the eight inch system, but it is updated. And now it's got the volume button on the outside and the tune button, just to make it a bit easier to use while on the go. And then in the back, we've got a USB-C port, as well as twin climate vents. It's not rare, but some utes still don't have climate vents in the back, which is just unacceptable for a, uh, you know, any new vehicle in Australia, in my opinion, especially one that has a cabin that's quite large. Plenty of grab handles and so on around. If you're going off-roading and things, the kids or even your workmates sitting in the back, they can hold onto all the handles and so on. But I do get the feeling this is, you know, it's, it's pretty basic. You can tell by the sort of monotone trim. This is more for working and, and off-roading, recreational, whereas it doesn't have the sort of more aspirational contrast stitching and so on. I think this will be a pretty good seller though, because you still get that appeal of all the black or darkened highlights, um, but it's reasonably priced. Although it does look pretty much the same as the 2019 model, the front bumper bar is updated, updated wheels and so on. Um, but one of the major changes to the new model is improved safety. So this has now got a 3D camera, so twin cameras up there that are monitoring pretty much what's happening on the road. And they've also got a wider field of view so that the cameras can just work more comprehensively to monitor the traffic around you. There's also an inbuilt defogger system apparently, so probably doesn't apply in Australia that much, but in there it's able to detect, I think it's when it goes below four degrees, it'll just make sure that the cameras don't fog up and then cause all these sort of issues where you know it's not monitoring properly. A little clever feature as well is on the side there you'll see a USB port, which is perfect if you're you know connecting up a, a dash cam, especially for fleet buyers and things or company car buyers. You know, they want to just make sure they've, they've covered themselves with a dash cam. So that's a really handy feature, I think. And another new feature is tire pressure monitoring, which I think is a must for a uh, adventurous sort of off-road style vehicle. Uh, and one clever, clever thing that it does, which I didn't know about, they said that this, it still did it with for the MY23 uh, model, but it's basically, when you go off-roading, you let some tires out of the, uh, let some air out of the tires. And then when you go to pump them back up again, it will flash the indicators when you reach the, the tire pressure that's marked on the placard here. So that way, you know, you're pumping up the tires and so on, you're at the petrol station or whatever, can't quite see what the readout is, or if you forget your tire pressure gauge or whatever, um, you can just wait for those indicators to flash and then you know you're at the, the, the sort of minimum requirement, I guess. Under the bonnet here, we've got the same good old 4JJ 3 litre turbo diesel four cylinder engine. 140 kilowatts and 450 newton meters. There's no mild hybrid or electronic tech under here. It's just the uh, pretty much the exactly the same as it was, what, four or five years ago. There has been some talk of it getting a hybrid in the future. Uh, there's a fully electric model launching in Norway soon, but there's been no confirmation yet if any of it will come to Australia. They've said that they're still weighing up what the best solution is for Australia. But yeah, at some point they will have to include some sort of electrification. But for now, I think this is good. Those sort of older school drivers out there that just want something that's pretty simple, but dependable, reliable, this is perfect for that. We're at a big proving ground at the moment and we can check out how it handles and so on. They've set up a little slalom down the back there and then some winding roads up the, up the back of the mountain. And then tomorrow we're going to go to a four x four circuit and really put this thing into some tough conditions to see how it handles. Out on this private road, we can see how it handles and so on, uh, but there's no major or fundamental changes to the powertrain or the suspension for that matter. The LSM has revised rear suspension to help, help it be more comfortable and also improve the, the, the suspension range as in the uh, better articulation off-road but there's no 
yeah, major changes to any of the steering or anything like that. It's an easy car to drive, even threading through this tight little section. I've got a slalom down here. It doesn't feel like a truck. It feels like it, more like an SUV in my opinion. So I can place the wheels exactly where I want them. You know, it's not a sports car, but it doesn't feel like a big, heavy, cumbersome truck or anything like that. We'll come back around here and push it a bit harder this time. Just why not? Get those tires squealing a bit. Stability control kicked in nicely. It's uh, able to pick up, grab the wheel before anything happens. Just then I noticed it was going to try and spin the rear wheel, but it hit the brake and stopped any, any nonsense. I'm in the LSU Plus, which is basically the top of the range before you get to the the X terrain, which has got all the, the dark highlights and things. But this comes with pretty much everything you could possibly need. It's more targeted to, you know, families and things that want to go on adventurous trips and so on. It's pretty luxurious. It's got some leather and nice trim across the dash. But yeah, you also get the new seven inch digital instrument cluster. The new screen is much better than the previous setup. It's much more responsive. So you can go through the different menus and things and it's quick to load. And you've also got better functionality. So now you just click this vehicle button down here and then you've got all your ADAS systems. You can easily turn off the lane keep assist and all that sort of thing. Go through, see your angles when you're off-roading and so on. Your tire pressure monitoring. Then you can just click the home button and take you straight back home. But what's also good are these volume and tuning knobs. So now you don't have to click the button constantly to, to turn it up or turn it down. You can just twist the knob there and it's much quicker and easier. And then down here we've got the digital instrument cluster screen, which is, yeah, again, just more comprehensive, looks nicer. You can toggle through the different displays just using the steering wheel button here, including the live tire pressure monitoring. It's just a nice update for what was pretty, you know, behind in the current standards, in my opinion. Now it's just much more refined. It's still not the best, in my opinion, just in terms of the size even, but the graphics are, you know, pretty basic, but I think that's what the D-Max is all about. It's not about complexity, it's about simplicity, durability, and even reliability. One of the major changes with the new model is improved safety features. Now, if you, you know, don't like all this safety assist stuff that seems to be happening these days, it's, it's, this is still good. It's still quite old school. It doesn't have a driver monitoring camera, one of those annoying things that keeps beeping at you for no reason, but it does have other systems to help improve safety. One of the major changes is to the lane keep assist function. So basically you push this steering wheel button, little symbol comes up on the dash and it will manage the vehicle inside the lane better than before. It won't bounce around. It manages to read the lane markings and make fine adjustments along the along the way rather than you know waiting to the you hit the line and it bounces you back the other way but then you've also got the emergency lane departure system so that's the default sort of in the middle that you don't need to push anything that's automatically on so if you get really close to the lane markings it'll pull the steering wheel over and give you a bit of a warning and you can turn it completely off by just holding down the button for a few seconds all right, so we're out on some property. We've got a few different little courses we can go through off-road. So this is a steep downhill section and then back up again. We've also got some moguls over the other side that we'll test out with the uh, new ter uh, rough terrain mode. I'm in 4H, uh, four-wheel drive. This doesn't have a proper center diff, so you can't drive in 4H on the tarmac. It's only on off-road, otherwise you'll get some transmission wind up and so on but we'll also engage low range just so we can go down this steep bit and then climb back up with ease. To engage low range, I'll just put it in neutral and then flick the switch, watch the little indicator flash, and that looks like it's engaged. And we can use the manual mode to select the gears as well. The first gear is obviously the slowest and we can just roll down, roll down the hill. We do have hill descent control as well that we can use. Easy done it, and then you can just hit the gas pedal and it will just continue driving. Down the bottom here we're going to engage the rear diff lock just to help get up this steep section. Although it's not, it's not that bad, but 
just easier with the diff lock on. But this might not look that steep, but it's actually quite steep in person. Like you struggle to walk up that. Having the diff locked does make it a bit harder to turn around tight corners like just then. So you might want to just engage it once you get straight, but it doesn't make too much difference, I guess. It's going really well. This is the dual cab with the tray on the back. So you've got awesome departure angle. Should have no problem getting up here. There is a little step on the left here. So I'll just leave it in first. Just gradually grow up, uh, climb up. And just steady all the way up. Beautiful. We'll go over to the moguls now. I've got a big line on my head from the camera. We'll go over to the moguls now and we'll check out this rough terrain mode. This has been available on the MUX uh, since last year, I think, or the MI22, MI23, uh, but first time on the D-Max. And basically what it is, is a more advanced traction control system uh, that comes in a bit earlier in the rev range. So instead of waiting for the wheel slip to happen and then engaging, it'll, it'll come in very, very soon. So I think it's 1200 RPM or something like that, where it will start to engage just off idle basically. Um, but it also works with the rear differential locked, which is very handy because this doesn't come with the front differential lock. So you might be in a situation where both back wheels are going good or one's off the ground, but you've got that rear diff locked. Uh, so it's sending power to the other one or it's both, both locked together, but it helps you get through. But then the front wheel might be off the ground or one front wheel might be off the ground as well and spinning away. With the rough terrain mode engaged, you're still getting traction management for the front axle. And we should be able to get through pretty easily. I've already seen the MY23, they ran the MY23 through and then the MY24 and the MY24 went straight through very, very easily or much easier. It still sort of slips a little bit, but the yeah, traction system will come in much earlier. So it won't spin away all the power. All right, so we'll try it without the rough terrain mode first. So I'm just in low range, uh, diff isn't locked and we'll go in manual mode and just go in first gear. Most of this is going to be pretty easy. I mean, it does look very steep and jagged, but as long as you've got the clearances, it's not too difficult. You don't really need uh, the diff locks and things. I mean, if you slow right down and get the wheels off the ground, then you're probably going to spin some spin some tires. But as long as you maintain a bit of speed, it's not too bad. As I said, this has got the tray on the back, so the departure angle is excellent and even if you do you know sort of scrub it out it doesn't really matter it's just the tray it's just scraping the front little trim piece there so this is where the rough terrain mode kind of comes in handy because the front wheel comes off or well, it comes very close to leaving the ground and it starts to spin whereas the, with the rear diff locked it's it still gives you some momentum there like right now it's sort of pivoting and if I keep accelerating it's just going to keep spinning so we'll put the diff lock in it's just flashing there so with the diff lock engaged it's able to get through much better but over here we're going to pivot around a little bit bounce around and the front wheels might start to lose traction as long as we just keep going at a steady pace That did it pretty easily without the rough terrain mode. So we'll do it again with it engaged and we might see a bit of a difference on this earlier section. To engage the rough terrain mode, you just push the button. A little symbol will come up there on the dash. And that should make it a bit easier. This has got the highway terrain tires on it, but they've made this course here out of sort of road based stuff. And it's pretty grippy anyway. It's not like really loose gravel or sand. So you don't really need all terrains and stuff like this, but if you go for the entry level models, you do get 
uh, all-terrain tyres. Okay, here we go. Slow down a little bit. I'll get it balancing. Yeah, it's, it's straight away. It's It does feel a bit easier. It's not when you get into those pivoting moments on two wheels, one front, one back, it doesn't kind of just wait. It just keeps going, carrying the same momentum because that traction management is just coming in a bit earlier and catching the wheel spin before it, or, you know, as it happens, basically. Yeah, it's a handy feature and you can engage that in any drive mode so 2h 4h or 4l you might be towing a boat out of a slippery ramp or something like that you don't want to engage four wheel drive for some reason or you're just in a bit of an awkward situation where it's going to take a while to engage just hit the rough terrain mode and it will give you just a more advanced traction management system and you might be able to get out without four wheel drive there we have it the 2024 isuzu d max I'll see if I can get away and do a sneaky zero to 100 run for you somewhere on the highway. But overall, it's pretty much the same as before. It's just got better technology. It's improved off-road and the touchscreens inside are much better than before, especially with that volume knob there. The D-Max was the third best selling vehicle outright in Australia last year. So customers obviously love it the way it is. So they probably didn't want to change it too much. I mean, they're falling a bit behind in terms of power output and torque in my opinion. 140 kilowatts and 450 newton meters. Yeah, you've got some rivals that are now 150 or even the Raptor and things like that, much more powerful if that's what you want. But if you're after a good, dependable, long-term ute, the D-Max remains as a very durable and trustworthy package. There's also heaps of customer feedback driven uh, upgrades, including on the, the, the sort of body back versions as they've got a gas strut there now, so the tailgate just drops down nicely instead of slamming down and a little, few little tweaks and things inside just to make the ergonomics a bit better, make the long-term drivability a bit nicer. There's also a ton of accessories you can get as well. So it doesn't matter what you want, a twin cab, single cab, uh, bull bars and all sorts of accessories, they can provide them direct from the showroom basically. All right, let's go out now and see if we can do a couple of 0 to 100 runs. I'm not expecting any change compared with the 2023 model. There's literally no changes to the powertrain in terms of performance or transmission or anything like that, calibration. Um, but I will try and get my hands on the 1.9 liter engine and see what that sort of performance that offers in the twin cab body style. 